slip the surly bonds of earth and dance the skies on laughter's silvered wings. Sunward I've climbed and joined the tumbling mirth of sun-split clouds and done a hundred things you have not dreamed of. Wheeled and soared and swung high in the sunlit silence. Hovering there, I chased the shouting wind along and flung my eager craft through footless halls of air. Up, up the long, delirious, burning blue, I've topped the windswept height with easy grace. Where never lark or even eagle flew. And while with silence, lifting mind, I prod the high, untrespassed sanctity of space, put out my hand and touch the face of God. Hi, and welcome to the ninth installment of The Dad Project. Glad to have you back, and tonight we will look at the small part my dad had in the collection of climate data. I love the term data mining. It conjures a picture of the seven dwarfs hi ho hi hoing their way into a mainframe and picking their way through veins of important information that, with the right amount of heat, can be shaped and formed into knowledge. Data mining is a technique used to find hidden information from large amounts of structured and unstructured data, and is further defined as the process of using computers and automation to search large sets of data for patterns and trends, to turn those findings into insights and predictions. Now, this is all jargon in one manner or another, but data collection is as old as the first proto-human figuring out they could reliably count the number of grazing herbivores by making marks in the dirt. Humankind's record keeping has improved as we moved away from the ephemeral quality of dirt and began keeping information on more substantial media like clay tablets, papyrus, animal skins, and finally paper. Weather has held a particular fascination for humankind and the recording of weather data has been done for centuries, but it wasn't until the 1880s that there was enough weather reporting outlets to have enough data points to have a sense of what and how the Earth's climate has changed and acted since that period. More importantly is to predict what it may do in the future. The power of the computer has made processing large amounts of data much easier. Let's face it, weather is rarely a surprise anymore as the predictive algorithms have become extremely accurate and powerful. Not that weather hasn't surprised us, but that's an exception and not the rule. So what does this have to do with my father? Well, we'll get to that, but first let's introduce his data collection device, the SP-2E Neptune. Like some other military aircraft that had served in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and even the 80s, the Neptune was the result of a need for a new airframe in World War II. The Neptune was in response to the Navy's need to replace the Lockheed Vega PV-1, Ventura, and PV-2 Harpoon, Maritime Patrol, and ASW aircraft with a more capable and long-legged aircraft. The P-2V's design would be an outgrowth of the Vega Aircraft Company's internal design study 135 for a replacement of their Harpoon in early 1941. That study would be revised for the Navy-sponsored Design Study 146 that was presented in 1943. The initial contract was preceded by a letter of intent in April of 1943, the formal contract would be signed a year later, and the first prototype would fly in May of 1945. And finally, the Neptune would join the fleet in 1947. Because of its initial lineage, the XP-2V-1 looked very much like it was born of that war. Guns bristled from a dorsal gun turret, a nose turret, and a rear gun turret. Aside from the guns, there was a torpedo bay and radar that would all be operated by six crewmen. Aside from the usual performance specifications, the Navy was also clear that this would be a relatively easy aircraft to produce and maintain. Lockheed would introduce improved production techniques that would provide for easier production and decrease the manufacturing costs of each aircraft. A major portion of the fuselage contour curved in one direction which allowed for the use of uniform metal skins. This led to the elimination of expensive forming by producing the center wing and mid-fuselage sections, including the bomb bay door area, as a continuous cross-section. 
This allowed for a multiple use of numerous parts and assemblies that would keep mating and final assembly time to a minimum. With all these considerations, the Neptune was also much easier to maintain. A complete engine change could be accomplished in 30 minutes, a propeller in 22 minutes, and an outer wing panel in 79 minutes. The upshot of this detail to minimizing the cost of manufacturing and maintenance was to make it more attractive to foreign buyers. The Neptune would be used by 10 foreign air forces. Ultimately, 1,177 of the P-2s would be built, with the final airframe coming off the assembly line in 1962. They would be retired from military service in 1984, but would live on as fire tankers until the final user, Neptune Aviation Services, retired their aircraft in 2018. Following the cessation of hostilities in World War II, the world was faced with the prospect of returning millions of combatants into civilian life. The U.S. alone had 11 million people in uniform. Along with those combatants was hundreds of millions of dollars worth of equipment that was no longer needed. Some of that equipment would go into mothballs, particularly ships. Some aircraft would live on, but thousands more would be scrapped for pennies on the dollar, and many of those were literally scrapped right off the assembly line. Additionally, the military's budgets were drastically cut, and the standing army was cut from millions to about 684,000 soldiers in 1947. When the P-2V began to roll off the production line, it represented a large portion of the Navy's meager post-war budget. With the fledgling U.S. Air Force fighting for their own budget dollars, the Navy needed some political capital and publicity to justify the P-2V program. The first effort was the flight of the Truculent Turtle, the first production P2V-1 that would be modified for a non-stop flight from Perth, Australia to the U.S. In a memorandum from the Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Chester Nimitz, to the then Secretary of State James Forrestal, he described the flight as, for the purpose of investigating means of extension of present patrol aircraft ranges, physiological limitations on patrol plane crew, endurance, and long-range navigation by pressure pattern methods. It is proposed to make a non-stop flight of a P2V-1 aircraft from Perth, Australia to Washington, D.C., with the possibility, weather permitting, of extending the flight to Bermuda. On the face of it, this was all to prove the value of a Navy patrol aircraft, the P2V. However, more importantly, was proof that the P2V had the range to deliver a payload, particularly a nuclear one. To that end, the planned record distance was to be 4,000 miles farther than a record set by an Army Air Force B-29 in 1945, the Pocusin Dreamboat, the Air Force's long-range bomber. The 11,235-mile flight by the Truculent Turtle did just that in 1947. These flights were all well and good, but both the B-29 and the P-2V used in their respective record flights were stripped-down versions of those aircraft, overburdened with fuel. In fact, the truculent turtle needed jet assist to take off JATO to get itself off the ground at the beginning of its flight. Later models of the Neptune would be fitted with jet engines to overcome the need for JATO. Aware of this, the Navy proposed the P-2V as a nuclear strike-capable bomber that would be launched from an aircraft carrier, negating some of the need for an extreme long-range capability. The Navy hoped this would maintain its political influence and parity with the Air Force. This was a play right out of Jimmy Doodle's playbook. Just like the P-25s that were launched from the WASP in 1942 on the Tokyo Raid, the P-2Vs would be also launched on a one-way trip as they were too large to be recovered by the launching carrier. The P-2V with its nuclear payload would also need to use JATO to get off the aircraft carrier deck and on its way. The U.S. Navy Bureau of Ordnance would build 25 outdated but more compact little boy nuclear bombs to be used in the smaller bomb bay of the Neptune for this purpose. Of the 25 bombs made, there was only enough fissionable material to complete 10 and then only enough initiators to complete 6. So as formidable a weapon as it was with only 6 bombs available, it had limited punch. The Neptune my dad would fly for his data mining was a bit more pedestrian than these early attempts at power projection. His mount would be one of the most numerous models of the P2V made, the P2V-5. That following 1962 would be designated the P2E, of which 424 were made. It would be this mark that became one of the first operational aircraft fitted with both piston and jet engines. 
To save weight and to avoid the complexity of two separate fuel systems, the Westinghouse J34 jet engines burn the same fuel as the piston engines instead of jet fuel. The jet pods were fitted with intake doors that remained closed when the J34s were not running. This prevented windmilling, allowing for economical piston engine only long endurance search and patrol operations. In normal operations, the jet engines were run at full power, 97%, to assure takeoff, then shut down upon reaching a safe altitude. The jets were also started and kept running at flight idle during low altitude flights 500 feet or below during the day and 1,000 foot flights at night and anti-submarine and or anti-shipping operations as a safety measure should one of the radials develop problems. The P-2 he flew had been attached to the VP-4 and VP-5 ASW squadrons before being attached to the Naval Air Test Center at Pax River. He and the crew would fly several times into Churchill, Manitoba, and most of their flights would originate from Yellowknife Northwest Territories in June and July of 1964, after jumping off from Truax Field in Minneapolis. But who needs these B-17 sized data collectors with two turning and two burning? In August of 1946, the Office of Naval Research, ONR, was established when legislation was signed by President Harry S. Truman charging the ONR to plan, foster, and encourage scientific research in recognition of its paramount importance as related to the maintenance of future naval power and the preservation of national security. The ONR is a many tentacled beast that funded and funds varied various research projects that included lasers, early computers, oceanographic research through Woods Hole, radio telescopes, research satellites, Sea Lab, and the project my dad would be involved with. In 1967, the Journal of Geophysical Research in Volume 72, Number 4, would publish Climatological Significance of Albedo to Central Canada by James McFadden and Robert Raguzzi who were attached to the Department of Meteorology at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. First, what is albedo? It is the expression of the ability of surfaces to reflect heat from the sun. Light-colored surfaces return a large amount of the sun's rays back to the atmosphere, high albedo. Dark surfaces absorb the sun's rays, low albedo. From 1961 through 1965, the P-2 would do aerial reconnaissance over the tundra and boreal forests of central Canada. It was modified to carry two Kip and Zonin solar meters on the upper and lower surfaces of the fuselage. The consistency in the fuselage surfaces mentioned earlier were ideal for an unobstructed field of view for the solar meters. From November of 1962 through September of 64, my dad would be the project officer and one of the pilots for these flights. In the same time frame, he was also flying the Skyhook project mentioned in installment 6. These were long flights with the longest lasting over 10 hours and for the data collection to be accurate, they were flown at 1,000 feet or less depending on cloud cover. A bit high for a former ASW pilot, but probably why he was so well suited for this job. In one of my sister's emails to my dad, she asked, other than the ejecting from the F-14A, what was the scariest moment as a pilot? To this he responded, icing up a big airplane over the northern Canadian tundra, 12 folks aboard, and starting to lose the battle between power and ice, which fortunately broke away. Windscreen covered with ice flying at 200 feet, that ice too broke away, he said. Other than this sporty situation, my dad's go-to word for difficult, it was a pattern tedious flight duty to help a study that looked at the temperature variations that happened depending on various conditions dictated by albedo. Snow cover, no snow cover frozen lakes, unfrozen lakes, and the various permutations when you mix those variables up. Now why would the ONR be interested in this? How does this pertain to the maintenance of future naval power and the preservation of national security? In simple terms, the Arctic Ocean is a strategic asset. The free navigation of our naval fleet in this area is considered critical and by extension critical to our national security. According to the U.S. Geological Survey, the Arctic is the last pantry on Earth and contains 30% of the world's natural gas reserves, 13% of the oil, and 9% of the coal, as well as significant metal reserves. For many years, the control of this region was dictated by the five countries bordering on the Arctic Ocean, Russia, the U.S., Canada, Norway, and Denmark but has since been convoluted by climate change with, among others, the European Union demanding equal access to the region and its resources. 
When my dad made his flights, the idea of climate change on a global scale was little understood or discussed. What was important to the ONR was the interaction of the variables mentioned earlier on the temperature fluctuations that would affect the immense scope of the boreal forest, boreal being a fancy term for the northernmost, in Canada in, in a broader sense, what that might do to the temperatures and weather on the Arctic Ocean above the tree line. As detailed in installment 6, Skyhook, the U.S. had already gone to great lengths to recover any equipment and records the Soviets had left behind on one of their abandoned drift stations on the Arctic ice. The Soviets had manned drift stations for many years before this clandestine adventure. The United States had its own drift stations and both sides were, among other things, doing meteorological studies and taking hydrographic measurements to map the ocean floor for the safe maneuvering of their respective submarines. In addition to the military implications of the ebb and flow of the Arctic ice was an economic one. With the discovery of large oil reserves in Alaska, the question of how to get the oil to market was a considerable one. The Alaskan pipeline was still an unpermitted dream, and one idea that gained enough traction to happen was to build an ice-breaking oil tanker. In late 1969, the SS Manhattan would make its way through the Northwest Passage, escorted by smaller icebreakers from New York to Prudhoe Bay, to prove the feasibility of the idea but it was determined that the pipeline was a more economically feasible approach. These two examples, however, are a macro view of the microdata that my dad and those 12 people on board the P2 Neptune tail number 128362 were collecting and would be a set of data points that a modern data miner can use for whatever weather and or scientific study could use such data. Unknowingly, my dad had done his bit for future climate studies had no doubt the information he and others gathered is invaluable to determine how the climate was and it being affected by temperature differentials in the boreal forests that gird the world at these altitudes. I'd love to say with authority where that information fits in or even what those effects might be, but I can't. That's for minds much bigger than mine and more sophisticated than mine. Before I leave, I'd like to thank Michael Notaro, director of the Nelson Institute Center for Climatic Research at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, who was able to direct me within minutes of my email to the study that was the result of the flights of the SP-2E Neptune, tail number 128362, those many years ago. And finally, I'd like to thank Mikey McBrien of Plane Savers the reality show Ice Pilots, and the general manager of Buffalo Airways for taking the time to ask his dad, Joe McBrien, owner of and pilot at Buffalo Airways, if he had any recollection of my dad's time flying in and out of Yellowknife. Joe didn't, but was able to identify the Norseman my dad had taken a picture of as one that belonged to Brock Rocky Parsons, who mainly used that aircraft in northern Manitoba and passed away in Yellowknife just last year. My dad can be seen here posing with a Cessna 195 float plane on Great Slate Lake in 1963, with the Norseman just peeking out in the background. Additionally is an image my dad had captioned as the world headquarters of Ptarmigan Airways, Yellowknife, Northwest Territories, Canada. So, until next time when my dad gets his introduction to the mighty F-4 Phantom, the iconic F-4 Phantom, and the deferred thanks for his service following his time in Vietnam. Thanks for joining me for the ninth installment of the Dad Project. I continue to tell the stories I had hoped my father would tell me, and I appreciate you all being along for the journey. So please subscribe if you'd like to hear more. And until next time, thanks for watching, and enjoy what life has given you. Ciao.